so yeah, Roberto, I'm a postdoctoral researcher at the Catalan Institute of Nanoscience and Nanotechnology here in Barcelona. And uh, thank you for giving me the chance to present this work that we published recently uh, with the title Unraveling Heat Transport and Dissipation in Suspended Monitoring Serenite from Balto Monolayer. So if you are interested in this uh, work, you can just, uh, you can find it in advanced material and uh, you can just uh, uh, scan the code here. Uh, so we're talking about 2D materials, so just a brief introduction. As you know, the 2D material, let me say that is the future of nanoscience and nanotechnology uh, because of the unique property. And among the wide class of 2D materials, there is uh, an interesting one called transition metallical cogenides, uh, TMDs, uh, that are uh, becoming more and more important because of the um, peculiar properties that go from mechanical to electric and also optical. Uh, property. Uh, so uh, that sometimes the properties differ from the bulk counterpart, and this uh, uh, is interesting for many different applications, uh, for example, transistors, photo detection, and so on. And when we talk about making them as real devices, it's important to uh, understand uh, the heat dissipation in these materials. So uh, the aim of this work is to address uh, the thermal properties, the thermal conductivity in particular, and the, how it changes with the thickness of the material. So yes, the answer is, the question we want to answer today is, does it the implant thermal conductivity change with the thickness? Um, for example, just to have an example, we know everyone knows silicon, which is the most studied material, and we know exactly what happens in silicon. There are many studies that predict the, the change with the thickness for, for the thermal conductivity. And for example, if we go down to a thickness of 10 nanometer, uh, the thermal conductivity is less than 10% of the bulk value. While when we talk about transition metallical cogenite, in this case in particular, we decided to study and focus the attention only on molybdenum serenite uh, as a um, uh, representative for the whole family, we see that there is uh, not agreement in the literature. Here I report some of the main uh, results for the thermal conductivity in the in-plane direction as a function of uh, thickness. And you, see, and you can see there are different studies that predict values that range from 60 watt per meter per Kelvin down to less than 10, per, 10 watt per meter per Kelvin. And not only that, but there is also different uh, trends. So there are studies that predict a decrease in the thermal conductivity, others that predict an increase with different slopes. And uh, um, most important, there is a lack of studies in the very thin uh, range uh, of thicknesses, so between one and 10 nanometers, uh, sorry, one and 10 layers. Uh, not only that, for example, for the theoretical studies, uh, so far there are only studies that predict the values for one, two, and bulk. While in the case of uh, experimental uh, studies, there are only, uh, let's say, uh, words in the range uh, uh, above 30 layers, with some exceptions. So uh, the idea is to do a, um, let's say, a, a work in which uh, we, we do a joint effort between a theoretical and an experimental group in order to predict what happens to the thermal conductivity in the in-plane direction for, uh, systematic, for systematically from one to, to the bulk. For doing that, we used, uh, from an experimental point of view, the Raman thermometry, and from the theoretical point of view, uh, density functional theory and Boltzmann transport equation. So let me just uh, talk about the Raman thermometry for, uh, for a second, because it's uh, an important part of the paper. I'm not an experimentalist, but it's good to, um, to have a clearer picture of, uh, of the mechanism. So basically, uh, I want to, to thank the people involved in this project, in particular David and Sabin, the two PhD students that perform the measurement, make the samples, and analyze the data. And also uh, my co-supervisor uh, class, uh, which is the leader of the ultra-fast dynamics and nanoscale system group in uh, at ICN. So basically, uh, for the experiment, they use the Raman thermometry, which is one of the most uh, uh, used techniques for uh, computing thermal properties. And it uh, utilized the Raman scattering effect of the light. So basically, this is the experimental setup for, for in, the, in this case, a tri-layer sample. But basically, they have a laser uh, focused in the center of a sample. 
and uh, the sample uh, the experiment is conducted in vacuum so they they don't have any extra source of um, dissipation and basically uh, once they uh, heat the sample they use the Raman thermometry both as a heater and a probe for uh, for the local temperature of the system so um, the the system is, is uh, made this way so they have a suspended area a very large suspended area and at the end of this area, they have uh, the substrate, in this case, a gold-coated substrate that uh, act as a heat sink. Uh, so basically, uh, how, how the Raman thermometry works. So basically, they measure uh, the Raman shift. So they um, use a pulse of a given uh, frequency, in this case, 532 nanometers, which is the Raman active mode, uh, A1G mode. Uh, and they measure the red shift uh, with temperature for this mode. So they can use this uh, at a very low uh, power to calibrate the system. Once they have this uh, uh, trend, they can perform the same measurement, in this case, keeping the temperature uh, constant and changing the absorbing power, so the, um, the, the power of the laser. And so they can have, in, also in this case, a Raman shift. Then they can correlate with an equation that is uh, well known in the literature, uh, the relation between uh, the derivative of the temperature and the power. And using only this relation and other geometrical parameters that go from the thickness of the sample to uh, the information of the laser spot and the whole spot, so basically the suspended area ra uh, radius, they can extract the thermal conductivity. Uh, that uh, looks like uh, let's say this slope in uh, in this plot here. Uh, I want to point out that basically they use many samples. They perform the measurement from one layer up to seventy layer, so a very wide range of samples. And for many of them, they have multiple uh, um, samples that they measure. So this uh, um, ensure the reproducibility of the experiment. Uh, I don't want to spoil the result, so now I will pass to explain the theoretical part, and then we will correlate the two um, uh, results together. From a the the theoretical approach, we use the, the density functional theory and the Boltzmann transport equation in order to study the lattice thermal activity systematically from one to up to six layer, never done before, and also for the bulk. And also, uh, we uh, we compared our uh, uh, finding with the experimental ones and try to understand that the microscopic or better nanoscopic, uh, um, let's say, uh, uh, nanoscopic, uh, let's say, uh, for that, at a nanoscopic point of view, what we observe and why we observe what we observe. For doing that, we use the density functional theory, as I said, as implemented in Siesta. Siesta is uh, a code uh, developed partially by a researcher here at ICM. And we interface this code with ten the temperature dependent effective potential method, which is a relatively new method developed by one of our collaborators, Ulla Hellman. And if you want to, to know more about these two codes, you can just look at the references or in the case of uh, TDAP also the GitHub page. For the theoretical part, I want to thank in particular three people that uh, um, uh, help, especially in the physical understanding, uh, Mathieu, Zela, and my supervisor, Pablo. Uh, and now I will explain briefly how the method we use works. So uh, uh, TDAP basically, uh, and Siesta together, as initial point, you need just to have a, a stable structure and some information on the supercell. So the number of supercell and the size of the supercell that obviously are material dependent. Uh, this is, for example, a unit cell of the system that actually is without the cell, but doesn't matter, in which uh, you basically have a van der Waals structure uh, where a metal is bonded with two calcogen atoms. In this case, the metal was molybdenum and the calcogen atom was selenium. And then using this approach, we create, uh, uh, let's say, canonical configuration according to the Bose-Einstein statistics uh, at a given temperature. This is how a supercell looks like uh, in, uh, in our measurement. So we create many of them. And I want just to mention that the initial uh, um, uh, work in which they use uh, this approach was uh, by Ion Herrera uh, uh, almost 10 years ago and is implementing the shop. 
so using many of these supercells, uh, according to the Bosanxian statistic, we are able then to, to compute the forces. How? So basically, for each configuration, we compute the atomic forces, so the derivative of the energy which is per the displacement, uh, using siesta. Um, once we get to the forces, we can extract the second and third order interatomic force constant using a, a model force. In this case, it was, a, um, let's say, to make it simple, uh, um, Taylor expansion in which we fit the, this model and then we do some iteration, uh, including also some parameters that, for example, uh, when we are talking about computational approaches, we have always to face with the cutoffs and the mesh grids. And once we have all these parameters, we are able to extract the properties uh, from, from the second order interatomic force constant, like phonons and all related properties, for example, the, um, um, the heat capacity, uh, and also uh, from the third order force constant, anharmonic properties, uh, solving the full Boltzmann transport equation, uh, so the thermal connectivity tensor, the interrelated properties like lifetimes, free path, and so on. If you want to know more about this method, you can just uh, have a look at the Ulle Hellman uh, GitHub page, in which the method is uh, explained much better than here. So this is the main result of this work. So basically here I'm putting the thermal connectivity, the in-plane thermal connectivity as a function of the number of layers. As I said, we perform the, the, um, the calculation from one up to six layer, and also for the bulk. Uh, the pink diamonds represent the value as 400 Kelvin, but we perform the same calculation in the range between 500 and 300 Kelvin. The reason of that is that the, these are the range of temperatures used by the experiment. And as you can see here, we see a slight increase in the thermal connectivity with the thickness of the material. And the value goes uh, for the 400 Kelvin uh, from 15 up to more than 30 watt per meter per Kelvin, but it's not like the same trend we observed at the beginning of this talk, for example, for silicon. Uh, also, if we consider the all temperature ranges, we can see that in the very low thick, uh, thickness range, there is not a real uh, trend. Uh, I mean, there is a flat trend with the term of the thermal connectivity with the thickness of the material. Um, when we compare our theory result with the experiment, we see immediately there is, a, that there is an excellent agreement. And here we are putting uh, in the, these circles uh, the values of the experimental values uh, for multiple samples, uh, including the error bar due to the experimental fits. And uh, so, as you can see, there is excellent argument, even in the experiment that they predict a flat trend in the thermal connectivity. And since uh, using this technique is not able to, uh, we are not able to predict the values at the very bulk uh, uh, level, we decided to compare the result with the previous literature rule. Um, uh, experiment, and uh, we can say that also with uh, the literature, our uh, values are in agreement. Uh, okay, so now the idea is to understand why we observe this flat trend. So, uh, as a starting point, we decided to study the spectral thermal connectivity, uh, which means that basically, so the thermal connectivity is an uh, integral. In frequency. So we can decompose the thermal connectivity as a function of the frequency. And basically, here we are plotting, uh, let's say, the values of the integral. So the area under this line represents the total thermal connectivity that I put in the previous slide. Uh, what we observe immediately is that there is a big uh, bump, a peak, a very big, uh, high peak in the thin sample, especially for the monolayer, but also for uh, bilayer. That becomes less and less important, and we increase the thickness of the material. When we reach, for example, the bulk value, we see that this uh, uh, mode, so this uh, very high peak uh, uh, centered in 0.1 terahertz, is compensated by an increasing peak at uh, centered in 1 terahertz. And basically, at the end of the day, what happens is that uh, these two uh, peaks compensate each other, and we don't have a real increase in the thermal activity. Um, just to here, I put a phonon band structure to have an idea of uh, which phonon mode we are talking about. So we are here in the very low frequency range uh, of phonons. And this is not surprising because we know that typically the thermal connectivity is mainly due to the acoustic or optical acoustic light phonons. And they are 
uh, to have an even clearer picture, I decided to split the contribution to the thermal activity due to the acoustic, real acoustic phonons and uh, optical phonon light, uh, acoustical uh, phonon uh, modes. And here you can see again that in the monolayer case, the, all the contribution and even in the bilayer case is due to acoustic phonons. And as we increase the thickness of the material, this is compensated by an increasing in, um, in the optical uh, ray, uh, phonon range. So uh, another conclusion we can extract from this kind of uh, uh, calculations is the cumulative thermal conductivity versus mean free path. So the phonometry path is basically, if we imagine uh, that it's not, uh, I mean, it's not completely correct by just um, a way to have an intuitive picture. If we imagine phonons to be particles, we can say that the metric path is um, a measure of how much they can travel before being scattered or dying, basically. And here we are in the micron range. So we are saying that the metric path are very high, uh, long mean free path. And we can say that in the case of uh, our system, the, if we do an average for uh, the all samples, the uh, total thermal conductivity, at least the 90% of the thermal conductivity, is reached with the phonometry path in the range of, uh, uh, let's say, 0 point something microns. In some cases, even in the one micron range. And this is important not only because we have to imagine that we are talking about materials with, uh, uh, let's say, the thickness of nanometers that uh, with phonons or collective modes that can travel for microns. And not only for that, but also because in the, from an experimental point of view, this is a really interesting and important result. Because, for example, in the thermometry, they have to make a hole in order to suspend a region. And they need to know if they are considering most of the thermal conductivity or if uh, making the sample with that uh, size they are, uh, let's say, killing um, some mode or, let's say, a percentage of the thermal conductivity. And since uh, they are uh, working in the range of uh, some micron, we can say that uh, by our calculations, that they are taking into account at least the 90% of the thermal conductivity. So we can also argue that their experimental uh, measurements are correct. And actually, they have to go to very large sample sizes to, to get this. Uh, uh, measurement correct. I want to conclude the presentation just giving a microscopic, uh, let's say, a physical picture um, to understand why we observe this trend and why the trend is, for example, different from other materials like silicon. And uh, uh, so the idea here is that in 3D bonded crystal like silicon, uh, most of the conductivity is, uh, uh, let's say, um, flows in whole direction. So when we cut the material, we make it uh, thinner. What we are doing is cutting these phonons. Uh, and this, uh, let's say, is a limit. So it's limited the, the, um, the phonons. And so the conductivity goes down. In the case of 2D crystals like EMDs, we are saying that most of the conductivity in this Van der Waals uh, structure is in the in-plane direction. Actually, there are studies that really the the, the out-of-plane value is an order of, in some case, one or two orders of only two lower than in the in-plane direction. So we are saying that making it thinner is not like a big limit uh, for the thermal conductivity because let's say that the main contribution to the thermal conductivity is not due to the boundary. And this could be an explanation of why we observe the, uh, a flat trend in the monodermal disseminite and not the same trend for the material like silicon, for example. Uh, so, to conclude this uh, presentation, I want to point out that we develop an uh, efficient and reliable method for uh, the calculation of thermal property properties. I want to say that uh, this method is computationally cheap from both sides. sides. So, from the data point of view, uh, we can say that we are making many configurations with relatively high uh, supercell. And using this way of averaging and, and let's say doing this statistical analysis in order to get the thermal properties um, is much uh, cheaper than other methods. From the other uh, side, Siesta is per se a very cheap BFT method in the sense that it can uh, handle uh, calculations with thousands of atoms. And at the same time, if we have 2D materials, is also uh, ideal because uh, using uh, uh, localized orbitals doesn't cost anything if we have a vacuum in, uh, in the 2D materials because 
and let's say the vacuum is for print, yes. So this is ideal for doing a sort of um, application for very, for let's say many materials, because it doesn't, uh, it's not an expensive method uh, from a computational point of view. Secondly, uh, we can say that it's reliable because we not only compare with this single experiment, but we are now um, working in other, um, let's say, material ranges. In particular, we recently um, published, or we are going to publish our work in which we compare uh, our results for uh, all the TMDs family in the two H stacking. Uh, here you can see, I put an example of, uh, um, of what we observe. So basically the dust line are our results. And we can say that our results are in agreement with the literature, the grain uh, spots, but also with the experiment that is performed using a completely different technique. And uh, finally, we can also say that uh, other materials are being studied uh, among the class of TMDs and not only, and we are, uh, seeing similar trends for thermocontinuity as a functional thickness. Uh, so this is the last, uh, last slide of my presentation. I want to thank the people involved, in particular the people at ICN, uh, my supervisors, Klaas and Pablo, and the two PhD students that uh, um, are, are responsible for most of the experimental work. All the external collaborators spread around the world, at least uh, around Europe, Mathieu, Zeyla, and Ulle, and of course, all the funding that allows me to, to, to make this research. And all of you for being here today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Roberta, for this nice presentation. So now there's time for uh, questions. So if you have a questions, please go to the reaction section and uh, raise your hand. Uh, Let's see, there's a lot of applause, so that's good. Uh, I, I, okay, maybe I can start with a, with a naive question. Uh, uh, you mentioned, maybe you can put up this, you can keep the slides up maybe. Oh, sure. So you mentioned that you so you have this uh, method that combines the Siesta code with this uh, TDEP. So in the TDEP, yeah. uh, I think on one of the slides it was written that you use the uh, harmonic uh, canonical ensemble. Yes. Could you say more about that? Is it somehow related to the to the Einstein model uh, of treating the? So basically, what the we do is uh, so you have supercells and we displace the atoms according to a Debye initial guess. So we um, okay, the, okay, yeah, and then since it's iteratively, we perform the calculation, we get the forces, and then we we put these forces back in order to create new configuration, and we see if the new forces are equal to the. Uh, previous one, so in an iteratively way. Okay, so it's with the the bio, uh, the bio model. Yeah, initially. Initial, yeah. initially. Okay. Uh, thank you. So it's, there's a question by Tom van Vaas. So please go ahead and mute yourself. Uh, thank you for this uh, very interesting uh, presentation. I have uh, two questions. Uh, the first one is you showed a, let's say, um, a, a mean free path of, of phonons. Now you've never uh, really come across, let's say, this, this, uh, the idea of, of defining a mean free path. But on the other hand, phonons are sometimes defined as, as let's say, sound waves in the material. So then a wave is something that then prop could propagate in the material. Is it also possible to see this? Uh, this defini definition of the mean free path is, let's say, a measure of how far the phonons could actually propagate. It's maybe a very trivial question, but is that possible then to see this as a propagation measure for these these quasi particles? Uh, yeah, I mean, the point is that we they are not real particles, so and they are collective modes. So let's say that this is a let's say a measure of. Uh, Let's say how much can travel, I mean, uh, how many um, atoms they import a single, uh, uh, let's say, mode. So I don't know if it's explained the question, but it's not like the phonon can travel freely in the material like uh, other kind of particles. So so not as a, a traveling particle, but more of a measure, in, as, as you say, of, of the size of, of a localized. Uh, yes. I see, I see. Um, 
a, se a second question on this. There is many, uh, I'm black blocking many questions of other uh, people. On the slide, I don't know exactly which one you said, we have excellent agreement between theory and experiment. Um, and there seems to be, uh, like you said, I think a sort of flat regime where there is little change of the thermal conductivity, but it looks like if we um, go up to um, a larger number of layers that there appears to be, well, maybe some some uh, increase in the ther thermal conductivity. Do you think it is feasible, uh, let's say in the near term in one way or another to try and perform also like simulations for, for let's say, uh, systems of the order of tens of of numbers of layer is that complicated? It's really complicated. So we go up to six layer, and it's a very uh, let's say high achievement uh, because we are keeping that we are uh, taking about I mean we are handling uh, thousands of atoms so far. Imagine that the single uh, uh, supercell is uh, depending on the number of layers goes from four hundred to up to one thousand atoms. And the calculation with more atoms become uh, difficult or even impossible. I see. OK, thank you for your uh, presentation and your answers. Any other question? I do have a question, but I'm waiting to see if I have the permission to. Arian, you're muted. I, I presume you said Michel, go ahead. But, uh, ah, okay. No, I, I said I, I wanted to to go to make a comment on this uh, and uh, to add a question to the side. But since I was muted, uh, not to create too much confusion. <laughs> so, Michel, please go ahead and, and ask your question. Okay, thank you. Uh, thanks for the presentation. Um, I guess I have one question. Is it, um, can you do temperature dependence conductivity and how low in temperature can you do? And is it possible to compare with experiment? Uh, okay, so we can do that. I mean, we can just define a different temperature as a starting point. So we can displace the atom according to a different uh, temperature and then we can perform all the process for other temperatures. But the point is that when we go down, uh, with the temperature, the quantum effect becomes more and more important. And so we are not sure that we can, uh, let's say, um, believe in our result for temperature that are under 100 uh, Kelvin, for example. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I muted myself. Uh, no, I was just curious. Uh, maybe you mentioned it. So the uh, so the pink uh, diamonds are your results. Yes. And and also, but also the line in the background. Uh, yes. Okay, so you did all the, the whole temperature range. Yes, exactly, from three to five hundred. Okay, and the four hundred is because uh, you you singled that out because it was the temperature of the experiment. Yeah, the point is that they are not sure. So the experiment has okay. a very uh, let's say. Uh, uncertainty in the temperature range so we decided to use this line as a this bar as an indication of the experimental setup okay uh, and uh, well uh, uh, a quick question on the on the experimental results so you had there was different if I understood well different results for the same number of layers so it's just because of their different samples and they give okay so there's a quite yeah. a difference but okay, because of the many samples, you can find this linear dependence. Exactly. Okay, in the on the log scale. Okay, thanks. Uh, any other questions? I uh, have a comment about uh, Michel's question. Oh, in, sure, Mathieu, uh, go ahead. In in a quantum regime, there are also people trying to do trying to combine this approach with uh, path integral molecular dynamics. Which allows you to to incorporate quantum effects, and this has been done on a few systems. So Ion, Rea, and uh, Calandra and Mauri have, have done this. Ulla Hedman has done this as well, I think, for polyethylene or something. But even in diamonds and other materials, you you can you can do it. Uh, it becomes really really expensive because instead of just doing some some classical dynamics, each of these supercells becomes a superposition of different. Uh, you know positions for the for the beads, but uh, 
it, it looks like it uh, it works, including for hydrogen in the high pressure superconductors. They did this for one or two of them, including uh, all this extra anharmonicity. So it's um, it looks like it captures everything, including the the low temperature. But as Roberta said, below 100 Kelvin, it's it's the, it's hell on earth. So it depends what you want to get out. I don't know what you're what you're thinking of. <laughs> Don't react to the comment. No. If not, uh, let's see. Uh, are there any other questions? I don't see any. So I propose to to thank Roberta again. Thank you for the talk. To thank you for the discussion. And see you maybe next time. Yes. Thank you, everyone. Oh. Uh, Ayan, thank uh, you. You you already have the name for for next month, just to ah think. yes 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 I said it at the beginning. Uh, uh, okay. Carla Verdi will, sp will speak at the sixteenth of December. Excellent. I should still collect her title and abstract, but um, the date and time is fixed. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks yeah. everybody.